Hey, good day and uh, welcome to everybody. Hopefully it's tuning in and uh, I'm really excited about being a part of the uh, on race online race industry week here. And uh, man, you know, what a great thing that these guys have come up with. And I'm Jeff Hammond. For those who doesn't, don't remember me or don't know about me, I work for Sirius XM right now hosting uh, the late shift and I'm excited to be, I'm going to be your host here during this session. And uh, I'm also excited about the fact that uh, John Kilroy stole, stole a little bit of my uh, thunder because I was going to say I'm going to be kicking it off with from guys from my, my backyard where I grew up in Charlotte, North Carolina, over yep. Concord Heights Brothers, and uh, really excited to have Scott, Scott Heights on. And Scott, welcome to the show. You know, you're the president owner of FSE and Heights Products and uh, Performance. So I hope you're doing well. And uh, during this uh, pandemic time, uh, Everybody's been a little bit concerned about that, but I look forward to talking to you about uh, what you got going on. And also, uh, is uh, Steve going to be joining us here in a little bit? Uh, I think so. Uh, okay. He should be coming on here pretty shortly. I talked to him probably about maybe an hour ago, gave him the login information. Uh, I know he was traveling back from uh, being out of town for Thanksgiving over the weekend, so he should uh, he should be connecting here pretty soon. Yeah, and Steve Francis is the technical director for Lucas Oil uh, dirt Lake models, uh, you know, former racer himself and champion. So I look to yeah. get some insight from him. But how's business right now? Tell us what's going on over there. Uh, business is good. You know, this time of year, it kind of starts to wind down with the end of the racing season. Um, uh, John was um, uh, It's good to hear from John. He's been in my, my store several times. But last week I closed the store for the week and I relocated to a new facility. I'm about three miles away right off of Highway 29, just north of um, the Speedway. Uh, road front, um, nice showroom. And I, so I spent most of the week last week moving in, um, getting height set up, getting FSE set up. Um, so uh, it's been been a lot of work, but uh, it, it should be a good, uh, a good move, a good location, and I'm excited about it. Well, John and Francis both kind of touched on it. Uh, the, the big crash they had over there mm -hmm. yeah. uh, in Bar East, um, it, let's talk about – FSE right on the get go because that's kind of like your newer product. I know a lot of people are, are looking and and making the switch over to running it, uh, your fire suppressant system. So right. where are you at today? And after seeing something like that, I mean, let's go ahead and, and get into yeah. it. Okay. Fire is the one thing I think that scares every driver that gets behind the wheel. I mean, they they they, yeah. they, don't, they don't worry about horrific crashes. They don't worry about cars disintegrating or trucks either Correct. one, but they're worried about fire. Correct. I've not talked to a driver, whether it be a customer, whether it be a friend, whether it be a relative, that fire wasn't the number one thing that they feared as a race car driver. That's the one thing that um, they don't feel like they can get away from in a quick amount of time. Uh, it spreads. It spreads quickly. Um, where there's an ignition source and an air source, then that's what happens. And so um, they all are very, um, very scared, very um, uh, conscious about uh, fire where a fire can break out, how a fire can spread. Um, so again, I think, you know, you can have the, the nicest, uh, best equipment as far as, uh, seat drivers, uh, safety, uh, gloves, uh, driving suit helmet. Um, but that extra layer of protection in a fire suppression system is huge. And a lot of drivers, you know, uh, cost always comes involved. You know, it's always, it's not an inexpensive, uh, uh, product. Um, but, uh, is something I think that's evolved, and I think uh, most racing organizations need to mandate some sort of onboard fire suppression. But but fire is the number one thing that a driver fears most of all. Well, you touched on a couple of uh, areas I want to get off into. Number one, you know, what do you where do you see the future of this of your product going? I mean, are we going to see bigger, or are we going to see a different can, you know type of chemical being used? I mean, what what is the future of fire suppressant? Because I mean, it's it's gone through from dry powder to, you know, whatever. I mean, you Correct. guys have tried a little bit of everything. So mm -hmm. yeah. where's, where's the future right now as far as that is concerned? Uh, well, over the last, what, 15 years, I know Halon was the big extinguishing agent that the, air, the military used, aviation companies used, uh, racing company, um, people that built for motorsports. Um, you know, the EPA banned Halon. They quit manufacturing, so they went to some alternative chemicals. Um, the one chemical right now that we use that's really good is called uh, Novec 1230. It's made by 3M. It's a very benign, calm, it's almost like water, um, but it puts out a fire and contains a fire better than anything that I've seen. And um, I just think with racing organizations, a lot of times, unfortunately, a driver 
gets burned or a driver dies in a fire at a racetrack before a lot of racetracks, a lot of sanctioned bodies will take, um, uh, will take action. Uh, and I'll let Steve expand on that when it's uh, his turn to chat. And he, like I said, he could probably tell you a little bit more about from a driver's standpoint. Um, but um, anyway, uh, hey, Steve. Um, hey, just got to – my voice wouldn't work for me, so yeah. I had to work on the voice part. That's got, I got you. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, so uh, I think what, um, what has evolved is uh, the need um, as people that run uh, racetracks and run organizations – the need to mandate something like that. And a lot of times there's some pushback with regard to the cost, with regard to how much it's going to cost to put it in and maintain it. But I think, um, you know, it's hard to, uh, it's hard to put a price on, on, uh, on someone's safety. So, uh, you know, I think that's, um, that's definitely um, the direction that we're headed. Uh, as far as the size goes, um, there's different size for different types of vehicles. Um, a lot of places man mandate only a five pound, system some mandate a 10 pound system i know in certain drag racing classes there's 20 pounds so it's all about the speed of the car how the car is designed and just what it'll take to suppress that fire and i use i like the word i came up with this that story about you know on a, a napkin at a restaurant i came up with the name fsc fire suppression engineering because i i'm reluctant to call them fire extinguishers i know that's kind of the buzzword in the industry but yeah. you know fire spreads so quickly and it doesn't discriminate about where it goes or what it burns or where it gets to. And so these systems are designed to suppress the fire. So the driver can get out of the vehicle and the safety people at the track can get there and extinguish the remainder of the fire. Do you want the extinguisher? I'm sorry. Do you want the suppression system to put the fire out completely? Absolutely. And a lot of times they do, but um, that's just another layer of fire safety that goes along with people that work at the track, the driver, the suit that you have, the helmet that you have, the gloves that you have. So um, I think it's just a, it's just a, a all encompassing thing as far as the evolution of fire safety from a racing standpoint. Okay. Well, Scott, while you were uh, pontificating, uh, Mr. Steve Francis is joining us. Steve, welcome. Yes. Good to, it's good to get a chance to talk to you. And uh, we, we talked about the fact that you are the technical director at the uh, Lucas Oil Dirt and Leap Model Series, you know, former racer yourself and that champion. So uh, we've been talking about, you know, the biggest thing that most race car drivers fear the most. It's got to be fire. I bet in your crew chief days, that was the number one thing you heard too. Just uh, anything but a fire, anything but a fire. Absolutely. <laughs> um, I think that's, that's across the board a hundred percent. Um, you know, we've worked with Scott on a lot of stuff on, you know, some of the systems and he's kind of took his system and perfected all the problems that were kind of inherent in the other ones, as far as all the way down the line lengths where they're, you know, we can install them in the racetrack in about 10 minutes. And, you know, that, uh, you know, that, that just makes a lot. He, uh, he's been good enough to us. He lets us keep a couple, uh, on board with us that we can loan out to a racer that's uh, running one of our events. You, you won't get on the racetrack at one of our events without one. They're, they're required for everybody to 10 pound system with two burn off nozzles. So, you know, every once in a while you'll run across a guy that just, uh, man, I can't afford it. I don't, uh, you know, don't have the money to buy that thing right now. So Scott's been good enough to, to work with the series and let us, uh, you know, allow that guy to still race at the same time we can sell him on the fact that it only takes one bad time to, you know, that $800, $900, $1,000 that you're going to spend on this system, whatever the number, however big or fancy you want to go, um, is really cheap money being spent. No, I think you guys, you know, you, you both touch on something that sometimes we, we get caught up in worrying how much something costs versus how much is your life worth. And that's the thing I think is so sad. Unfortunately, in my racing career, you know, I, I've witnessed – uh, not only people get burned, but some people lose their lives because of it. And I think that, you know, as we're having this conversation, it's like where and how do we go about making people realize that if you can afford to race, you can afford to protect yourself. I mean, we've already, you know, got a lot of people believing in now Hans devices and all the other things that go with it. And we've improved so much. And yet we see, you know, by, the events of this weekend, uh, we haven't been able to come up with a, a foolproof way to crash one of these vehicles and guarantee it won't catch on fire. I mean, there's sometimes the force no, of the fact that you just you can't control. 
No, I mean, and then, you know, we uh, we had an accident in the Dirt Lake Model World. I think it's been about probably four to five years ago that a man lost his life. Um, and as you go into researching, you know, he had a fuel cell that wasn't an SFI rated fuel cell. Five or six things contributed to it. No, no fire system in the car or anything like that. And that really brought on a change in the dirt lake model world to now everybody's fuel cells are SFI rated. Everybody has a 99% of the 90% of the country already has the, uh, you know, the fire suppression systems in the car, the 10 pound with two burn off nozzles that was kind of mandated across the board from all the, all most of the sanctioning bodies. Um, there's a few that are still, you know, lagging a little behind on that, that are get argued the same, what well, costs so much. Well, man, it don't cost so much. You know, you're racing a dirt late model, a hundred thousand dollar piece of equipment, and you're going to argue about a nine hundred thousand dollar fire system. I mean, you're going to spend that to go race two weekends. Um, skip those two weekends. Go put your fire system in. Make sure you got a good fuel cell. Make sure you got good gloves. Pay attention to what stuff the racetrack actually has. Um, you know. If they, we don't ever want to use it, but their fire system, driver evacuation systems, uh, you know, anything like that, pay attention to what's going on around you a little bit. Um, pay attention to the racetrack. You know, they got a blunt wall sticking straight at you. Just all those things play into safety in a dirt late model or any race car as far as that goes. Uh, excuse me, Steve. Let me ask you this right here also, and going back to you, Scott, um, when we talk about, you know, we're, we're talking about your fire suppressant systems, but let's let's expand this a little bit further and, and, and look at what can you do as a parts distributor? What can you do as a technical advisor to touch on all of these problems? You know, when people come into your store or, you know, talk to you at the racetrack about it, how do you, how do you best serve them as far as, um, the, the certification part of it. I'm talking about, you know, the fuel cells and even the fire extinguishers, they've got to be certified every so often. Seats have got to be certified. Belts the same way. And, you know, and no matter what series, everybody's got a little bit of a variance, but let's just say it's got a life expectancy of three to five years. Mm -hmm. Is there anything in, in the manufacturing world of like bring something back in that says it, it's expired? Can it be, you know, rejuvenated can it be re re recertificated recertificated mm -hmm. and and utilized anymore i mean mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying is a lot of guys could say you know this could help me a whole lot if i could get another two years out of it it's never been damaged it's, it's been taken well care of is there a possibility of any of that um you know still having to make sure that you steve look at it and say hey it's a thumbs up or you scott saying yeah we can do this because it hasn't been damaged and yes we're not feeling like we're going to get you in trouble or us in trouble uh if we say you can go two more years on it right steve you want to go or you want me to I'll, I'll go i mean we I work go. with scott a lot I, I think scott's probably going to attend our first event at brunswick georgia at golden isle speedway um, I know he works with some of the chassis manufacturers, you know, Hey guys, uh, you know, these bottles have a two year recertification on them. So we know a lot of that stuff is coming close to due right now. Um, so Scott's already, he came a year ago and, and come to golden Isles, and the guys were able to bring their bottles there. He was able to recertify their systems, put the new stickers on them, clean them up, you know, reservice everything. Um, you know, all those things just to, uh, to help the racer, you know, um, he's really been a big part of that. Um, as far as the fuel cells and stuff like that go, you know, that's a little bit more of an elaborate, uh, elaborate thing. So, um, but you know, as far as his fire bottles, um, he's been really good at fire systems. He's been really good about making sure they're certified and he can recertify other people's, um, you know, all those things. So, uh, that's been really good. Yeah. All right. Um, from from my standpoint, as far as the, uh, the 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 longevity or the or the the um, life of the bottle, um, a lot of that there's a lot of factors that come into play. Um, Jeff, as a nice car guy, you can remember where the bottles were put in the passenger's floorboard, just to the right of the, the transmission tunnel. They stay inside. Um, they get dirty or 
grimy at times, but relatively they're out of most, most of the time they're out of the elements. Well, in these dirt late model cars are literally outside the cockpit and they're seeing a lot of elements from the track mm-hmm. as they're going around. And um, I was trying to talk to somebody, I, I, somebody sent one in to get it worked on. And I'm telling you, this thing, look, I, I told them, I said, did you drag it behind your truck <laughs> on your way here? Because it looks like it has yeah. completely been just, it was destroyed. Hoses were broken, agents gone, uh, sensors are burst, labels are gone. And so when you get to thinking about it in a dirt late model, when that car is in the turn and the right side of the car is digging down towards the track, the bottle is literally probably 12 to 18 inches from the racing surface. And you're getting dirt, you're getting rocks, you're getting stuff like that that's coming to hit the bottle. So keeping those bottles inspected, keeping them clean and, and, and taking a look at those things to make sure that there's nothing that has damaged them is very important. If there was one thing I would like to do, I would like to see about maybe encasing the, the cylinder somehow to kind of protect it from the elements of the racetrack. But that's a whole a discussion for a whole nother time. But it just depends on what the condition of the bottle is. I've had some NASCAR bottles that came in and SFI determines the, the life of the bottle. They, they, uh, the 17.1 spec says that the bottle needs to be reinspected at least every two years. Mm-hmm. And then at the end of six years, it's done. You can't reuse it. It is not recertifiable for SFI. If there's another racing organization that doesn't go by the SFI spec that says, hey, we can use a, a, a used out of date fire system that probably still works good, then they choose to do that. But SFI kind of determines that. Um, but I've been, I've seen some that were six years old and I'm like, this thing looks like it just got taken out of the box. So a lot of that has to do with who makes the rules. Um, from my standpoint, when a bottle comes into me, I need to make sure when it goes out that if it was my race car, then I would feel comfortable putting that bottle in there and knowing that it would, would be, uh, in the best possible shape to do its job. Now, also on the parts, parts part you were talking about, Jeff, a guy comes in and wants to buy a fire system or he's made to buy a fire system. Well, then you get to talking about, okay, well, what are you doing for fuel lines? Well, I just use a rubber line and a brass push on hose. Okay. Then we need to talk about how to better use a better uh, fuel delivery line. Mm-hmm. What do you got for a fuel cell? Well, I just got this plastic so-and-so. Does it have a rollover valve? Well, I don't know. So then you kind of have to educate them. Oh, okay. The fire system will do its job if it's installed and managed properly, but you also got to take into consideration where that fuel is and where it's going in the event of a crash. If it gets out of that cell, if a line breaks, if a fitting gets knocked off, that all p- comes into play. And usually that's what happens is, is there's something that has broken or been damaged to cause that fire. So now it's up to the fire suppression system to do its job. But if you can kind of spend a few extra dollars, it's not a lot, but a little extra money and make good lines, good connections, good fuel cell, good rollover, flapper type design, that will cut down on a lot of the issues that a lot of people have. And just real quick before we defer to Steve here, I was sitting there when you were talking about the bottles and everything. I was envisioning these dirt guys working with somebody and getting a carbon fiber, you know, basically capsule to put those kind of bottles Mm -hmm. in, Mm -hmm. something that wouldn't be a lot of weight, but yet could take the blows, you know, from the rocks and and some of the stuff. And yet, you know, Make it where it's you know yeah. benefits the longevity right. of that, and uh, I'll, that's my opinion, Steve. So I'm gonna let you comment about it. <laughs> that's uh, I, honestly, it's something I hadn't thought that much about. You know, it make the bottle a little harder for us to inspect date on and stuff like that. You know, we'd have to basically take it completely out of the car and just crawling under and looking. But it's definitely it would protect the bottles. I see some right now that are just like Scott yeah. said, look like they've been through World War Three already, yeah. and you look at the date on them and they're half a season old. You know, these dirt lay models, they dig the frame rails and everything else into the ground, you know, right on that cushion of the racetrack. And it uh, kicks a lot of stuff up. There is some, a lot of the chassis builders now are, are kind of putting some filler panels in the right side of the body just to try mm-hmm. to protect, yep. you know, the transmission, the starter, the the things like that in that area, along with the fire system. Most mm-hmm. of your battery cables and everything run right through that area. Um, we as, at the Lucas Oil Late Model Dirt Series, we run a tech line a lot, probably 60% of our races. And we'll also at the same time, we'll do a safety check. Just going back on all this stuff that we've been talking about. And I have actually looked and found seat belts that are nine years old in a dirt late model. I didn't even know they had a date that expired. You know, when you tell the guy that, well, where can I get a new set at? You know, instantly. 
And a lot of it's just about informing people of how long this stuff is, is supposed to last. You know, sure. nine-year-old seatbelts in a dirt lake model that gets washed, gets dirty, gets wet all the time. It's not in protected elements. You know, it's, it's right. nasty. Um, and you see stuff like that way more often than you'd think. A guy buys a brand new fire suit. Man, this is, this is the trickiest thing. You know, it's this, um, all shiny material and everything. You get to look at it. It doesn't even have an SF5 rating on it because it's a go-kart suit. He just wasn't informed. He just paid a thousand dollars for this suit. That's not even SF5 rated. Well, again, it's almost like, and Scott, in, in, in your same way with you, Steve, you guys have been around the sport of, of racing for a long time. And I think it's still today, uh, it, it's one of the most scary things that I see uh, that people are uneducated. We probably need seminars on giving them better information on how to um, be smart about what you're doing. We want to keep you safe. We want to keep you racing. And at the same time, don't let somebody sucker you into spending money on something that you should never be t touching to begin with. I mean, you know, you can go and get – I think about some of the pictures I see uh, back in the day when guys were taking regular uh, white coveralls and dipping them down in that solution to try to make them fire retardant. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that was probably going to give you a grand total of 10 seconds longer than what you'd had if you'd just been riding around in your BVDs. So it's like <laughs> – really a uh, it's a scary part of the deal that always worries me when i see anybody with the you know seats not put in properly wearing helmets that are that are outdated and we're thinking that they can get a pair of leather gloves you know from the lo local tractor supply and go out and race and not worry about get, catching on fire so uh i think you know you running your it's side, up, you, you see it and you live it every day when people show up with something like, well, where did this guy come from and what racing book did he ever pick up and read? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, as I raced, I drove for 35 years. So I went through, I, was, I, I can be honest, I didn't have a fire system in my car until probably 2015. <laughs> probably the first 30 of my years, 28 or 29, I raced without a fire system. That won't happen to me. That won't happen to me. Um, you know, I started racing right after the Jim Dunn incident that all dirt lane mile races will remember. That was the, the first one. And then after this last one here, um, uh, this boy that had the problem in Ohio, it really, uh, changed my aspect on it. And you're right. I see seats that are mounted with a piece of two by two tubing with a hole drilled through the middle and a five inch long bolt. Um, mm -hmm. You know, hey, we gentlemen, quick, I know we're getting, we're getting to get short on time, and we had a question from one of the of the folks out there, uh, Derek Dixon, wanted to know if there is anything out there that either you, Scott, uh, or you, either one, Steve, of how to do something like this. Is there any kind of uh, YouTube deal of how to put a fire extinguisher in, what you need for your series? Where can we tell these uh, viewers to go? to maybe get some information a little bit like we were just touching on right now, because there's a lot of uneducated folks and sometimes they got great intentions, but they don't have the the knowledge to, to put something together properly. Okay. Um, I'll answer that. Um, uh, my Facebook page, Fire Suppression Engineering, has a video that Eric Reniger, um, who's a dirt late model guy from up north, uh, installed a system in his, in his race car about maybe six months ago. So you can go to my um, Facebook page. Um, that video is posted there. YouTube has some good videos. Um, uh, every system that we sell, um, every pull cable system that we sell comes with an installation uh, sheet. Uh, and I still get calls. I mean, I get calls all the time from people with other systems, from people that I haven't heard from in years. Okay, I'm getting ready to take this system out. What line can I loosen? What, what set screw can I move so I won't set this thing off? So, you know, a phone call as well. Um, I'm more than happy to answer any questions. Um, I think for the most part, as long as you've got it mounted solid, um, uh, mounted either upright. I haven't touched on the angle or the, or the location or the uh, orientation as far as how the bottle is supposed to be mounted. But if you can mount it upright or, or laying down, not inverted at all, but flat to slightly upright, or standing uh, vertical as well. Those are the best um, uh, ways to do it um, to make sure that all the agent is discharged in the event of any kind of uh, any kind of uh, fire. But as far as installation goes, you know, uh, run your 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 hoses, secure them with uh, not with a zip tie. See if you can get like a nice clamp or a, a stainless clamp or something like that, um, and make sure that they're out of the way that they don't dangle and move around where they could be damaged during uh, you know during racing conditions.
All right, guys. Well, look, it's been a pleasure having you on our uh, online race industry uh, week and sharing your information as far as safety, your products, and your experiences in racing. Steve, Scott, uh, look forward to seeing you guys maybe around the racetrack here in the future. Absolutely. And, uh, again, you will listen, folks. You can pick up the phone. Chance to get in touch with these folks, and you can learn a little bit more from you. So thanks for being with us, guys. Thank you, Jeff. Registering on EPAR Trade is easy. Fill out your name, email, phone number, and create a secure password. Next, select your business type. Choose supplier if you're looking to display products or services and connect with buyers. Choose racing business if you're looking to find new parts and connect with suppliers. Choose race team if you own or are a member of a professional racing team. Begin typing your company name. We most likely already have your company in our database, which you can select from the drop-down. Then, enter your job title. Choose Claim Company if you'll be editing your company profile. Other members of your company can choose Join Company if they'd like to use ePartrade as well. You can view and agree to our terms of use here. If you'd like to receive our weekly newsletter, choose Accept. Click Register Now and your registration will be submitted for approval. You'll need to confirm your email once it goes through. To keep our platform industry only, you'll be approved shortly after. If we require additional proof of business, we'll reach out. Welcome to ePartrade.